MDTA financial finance committee page. All members will have their video active during the entirety of the meeting. I ask that anyone who is presenting or answering a question to please turn your video and audio on when speaking. When you are done, please turn your video off and put your audio on mute. For members of the public who have pre-registered to speak on an agenda item, we invite you to listen in, but ask that you please refrain from disrupting the meeting. I will provide you an opportunity to comment after your agenda item is presented. We appreciate everyone's patience and ask that you hold any comments until the designated time. To minimize background noise during the call, I would ask that everyone on the line please mute your phones except when speaking. At this time, we will move on to agenda item number one, the approval of the open meeting minutes from September 8th, 2020. And I ask if there's a motion to approve the minutes as presented. This is member Ardinger, I so move. Is there a second? This is member Rosen, okay. second. All right, thank you. Um, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carry. Thank you, the minutes are approved. The second item on the agenda today is contract number MT31350000, Security Systems Maintenance and Service. And presenting today will be Amanda McKenzie. Welcome, Amanda. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning. <clears throat> this contract provides for the security systems maintenance system and for service for all of the MDTA buildings. The contract contains fixed prices, as well as includes all labor materials, specialized equipment, service, transportation, supervision, and incidental materials necessary to ensure the satisfactory and efficient performance of all MDTA security systems. This contract will be awarded to ARC Systems Incorporation with MBE goals of 8% and BSBE goals of 1%. Okay. Um, are there any any uh, questions from any of the members? Okay. Um, <clears throat> I do have a, um, uh, a question or two, real quick, if I may. Um, the um, uh, let's see. Let's see. I'm sorry, go ahead. Someone comment? No? Okay. Um, there's, there seems to be a big gap in that number on the, on the two um, uh, bids. Everything is, I guess, checked out on that? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, we, we were kind of shocked with that number as well. That was extremely over even our engineer's estimate. I'm not sure where that number came, where they got that number from. Okay. Um, on here, I let me see. The, um, just taking a look here one more time. Mm -hmm. Um, engineer's estimate. Do we have that? Uh, yes, I believe that was on page 10, I thought. No, but I can pull that up. believe it was it was I think one million but I want to give you the exact number uh, 
Okay. <clears throat> It was open. Sure. Uh, the engineer's estimate was 1.19450. Okay. All right. Well, we'll um, make a note of that um, for the record. Um, okay. All right. Um, any any other comments or questions from any of the board members? Any of the board members? Um, I'd like to make a motion uh, that we approve this contract. Okay, we have a, a member from, I mean, a, a motion from member Rosen. Is there a second? This is member Ardinger, I second. Okay. Um, any further discussion? Okay, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, it's unanimous. Um, all members voted unanimously for this. Um, this is approved. Thank Motion you. Approved. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. All right, we will move on to um, item number three. Uh, let's see. And we have, this is an update um, on contract number J. O one B zero six zero 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 one zero IVR upgrade at the Bay Bridge. And David Dykes will uh, present. Good morning, David. Good morning, everybody. How are you? I assume you can see me. We can. Okay. Yes. First, first time I ever had to use the camera, so that was new to me. Um, okay. So this morning I would be presenting to you the uh, contract to. Um, upgrade the IVR system at the Bay Bridge. The contract will provide a turnkey solution to upgrade the 1877 baseband IVR servers and the associated applications um, and upgrade the traffic management applications associated with the IVR. The, um, that is the uh, part that the actual baseband operators use and see to put the information out on the IVR. The system's located at the William Preston Lane Jr. Memorial Bridge. The procurement was conducted as a PORFP, Purchase Order Request for Proposals, under the Maryland Department of Information Technology Master Contract 060B140048 for PBX3 Telecommunications Services and Equipment. As the MDTA uses the NEC SV9500, which is the PBX that actually supports the IVR, as part of the IVR system, there are only two master contractors that can perform the specified IVR integrations with the NEC component. Only one proposal was received. The proposal has a fixed cost of $1,029,469.10 and there's been an MBE goal set of 35%. Okay. Um, any questions from any members? No? Okay. Um, I do have the, a question uh, or two, just real quick. Mm -hmm. The um, I know there are, there are only two contractors with these credentials, I guess, at this point. With the um, yeah, that that, um, that is correct. The Maryland Department of Information Technology. Um, do we provide feedback to um, uh, the Department of uh, the, the the Maryland Department of Information Technology on the participation of these contractors? Actually, the contract or, leaves MDTA. And it's reviewed by um, the um, Department of Information Technology. State do it. They actually take the contract and they check it for all of the the proper wording for you know the the um, PBX3 contract. We receive it back, and then that's when we put it out. So they are they are well aware of all of the bids and and how they came in because they kind of help manage the PB. Well, they do manage the PBX3 contract. Okay. Um, Hi, this is Duncan Morris. 
Oh, I'm sorry. It's Jeff Davis, Division of Procurement. I just wanted to add to his response that we do request no bid forms from the uh, master contractors, and we do share those with DOIT, uh, their responses for why they may not have proposed. Thank you. Okay. And then I guess, um, how do we know we're getting the best value? I know we're not going to, this isn't an approval issue for us today, but I'm just I'm curious, how do we know we're getting the best value? Um, this is a very, um, to try to, this is a very, very small, I guess, market, or there's a small percentage of people that um, offer these type services. Uh, the best way to say is just, you know, from past experiences from other state agencies, there has been one or two that have gone out to try to do an IVR system through another vendor. Um, they've hosted them off site. There's been different ways and a lot of them have been not very um, desirable on their outcomes. Um, as far as best value, we do have a very solid working system, um, which helps kind of justify the cost. Um, but there's really not a whole lot of ways to go out because of the, because of the technical portion of this without going through a lot of like, um, I guess, outside procurement to different vendors throughout the country, um, we have to probably basically base our experience or past experience with this vendor that we use. And, and, and also, so just for your information, this vendor is, um, he's pretty, um, I guess the word would be entrenched with the um, state of Maryland because he also does all the IVR systems for MVA and MTA and any of the other agencies, uh, state do it. Um, all of those people that have an IVR, they basically use this company because of their performance and um, and their and their working relationship with the uh, the PBX contractor that that the MDTA has. Okay. Uh, if, if you would like, I could just expand on that. Um, slightly just to state that the um, in comparison to the 2014 contract um, equipment costs increased uh, an average of two percent over that time and the labor rates increased three price uh, by three percent which is both allowable per the PBX contract so it's within the rates established on, in the contract okay and the duration of the contract is it says 40 days is that correct one year yeah, from those the, uh, Dave, I'm sorry. Please. No, no, no. I, I, I thought the intent was to get this on the um, BPW agenda in November. And once it's approved, the PBX3 contract um, is supposedly expiring. I, believe, I, I don't know the exact date, but it's somewhere around the end of the year. And they checked and seen if it was possible, but they said they should be able to get it in and working before the end of the PBX3 contract. But we were also told by State Do It that once the task was awarded, even if the contract will expire, they will have time to finish it as an open task on the PBX3 contract. But we still would like to try to get it in and done before the end of the, of the contract. Right, but the contract term is one year. The vendor has uh, committed to having it completed by uh, 12 31 2020, but the term can extend past the uh, 12 31 date per state to it. Okay, all right. Thank you, uh, David and Jeff. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you. Any other comments or anything from any members? OK, we will. Um, thank you very much. We will move on to the next um, item on the agenda. And that would be the. Uh, financial statements overview of uh, Canton Development Company's consolidated financial statements for the year ending December 31, 2019. And Deb Sharpless will present, and uh, John Magnus is here from Canton, and um, also David uh, Bordner is here. 
um, and welcome uh, John and David. It's uh, good to uh, see you, I guess, even virtually. So I guess we will turn this over to uh, uh, Deb Sharpless. And you're um, on mute, Deb. You'd think after all these months, we'd have this down. Uh, for the record, I'm Deb Sharpless, Chief Financial Officer for the Maryland Transportation Authority. Uh, I just want to introduce John Magnus, uh, President of Canton Development Company, and David Bordner. They will present the financial statements um, to the committee. The Canton Development Company, as you know, MDTA is the sole shareholder of the company. And, um, you know, we account for them as an investment. So, John, if you would like to take over. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, in your packet, we, we have sent out a, a, a few slides that if everybody would care to follow along, that would be great. Um, I wanted just to get a little bit of a history about Canton for those who weren't that familiar with us. Uh, compare our 2019 uh, financial results and uh, the, what's currently happening uh, here at Canton. Um, Canton was uh, originally uh, chartered in 19, 1906. Uh, as a private enterprise uh, through a development um, known as Canton Company of Baltimore. Uh, the MDTA acquired us in 1987 when the uh, Seagirt Marine Terminal was being constructed since Canton owns the rail access to the port's container terminal. And the MDTA did not really want a private enterprise to control that. Uh, we currently serve uh, about 32 uh, industries and uh, the Ports America uh, Chesapeake operation at Seagirt and CSX and Norfolk Southern now uh, both use our tracks to access the uh, container terminal at the port. We have a, a grand total of 24 employees, uh, six locomotives of which uh, they're back in. And we have a, uh, another uh, small enterprise of uh, three people that work up in Cecil County, uh, switching an industrial park there. Uh, the um, auditor's reports for, for 2019 versus uh, the prior year show that um, we had quite a, a very successful 2019. Um, right now, our cash and investments uh, are a little under $7 million. Um, we had an increase in our um, plant and equipment of uh, about $755,000 and total assets in the company are $15.6 million. Um, in 2019, we had zero debt. Uh, that will change in 2020 due to a property acquisition that we made in which we um, uh, took out a loan from, from M&T Bank to cover. Um, and at this point, we uh, did not have a, a, a dividend accrued to MDTA, and that's at the request of MDTA management who asked us to use that money to reinvest in the company. And um, our on paper stockholders equity increased by almost 11%. Uh, under our statements of income, uh, 2019 was a very good year. We did six and a half million in gross revenues versus 5.7 in 2018. And our net income was a little over $1 million in 2019 versus 587,000 in 2018. Uh, the financial ratios of the company are very strong. Our current ratio is uh, 6.7, which is excellent. And our operating ratio is little under 84 percent which means that uh, 84 cents of every dollar of revenue that we earn goes toward our operating cost as you can imagine a railroad is kind of a high uh, capital uh, business even for a small railroad like ours um, and our profit margin on sales was of course 17.3 percent 2020 has not been as as good as uh, the prior years uh, COVID had, had, did have an impact on that, plus some changes in, in customers. We, we lost uh, two customers of significance off our railroad, 
Uh, one was the uh, Home Depot lumber business, which moved down to Sparrows Point, Trade Point Atlantic. And we also lost a company called Barker Steel, which um, lost their lease and had to move. So they, those two impacted us uh, so far in 2020. Uh, the uh, current things that are happening at Canton, um, this year we did uh, work out an access agreement with Norfolk Southern to access the Seagirt Marine Terminal for the first time. And that started about two months ago and that's been working very, very well. So at the, at the uh, present time, the port has two class one railroads operating on its terminal. Uh, we're working through our, our normal uh, adjustments where we gain and lose customers and, and uh, we continue to try to uh, work out new ways to get business even in a gentrifying community that we're, we're operating in. Uh, we currently have two grants uh, that we are working through. The first one was a uh, Volkswagen grant, which was um, administered through the Maryland Department of the Environment to replace two of our six locomotives with uh, tier four uh, engines that will uh, reduce emissions. Uh, Though the first one will probably be delivered before the end of October and the other will probably be early next year. Uh, we also have been told by the Department of the Environment that there may be a possibility. Uh, so for our out-of-pocket cost on that for two locomotives was $200,000. And these are locomotives that are approximately worth $2 million a piece. So that was quite a, a quite a gain for us. The other is we got a Chrissy grant of uh, 1.6 million from the Federal Railroad Administration, and that is to replace 28 uh, switches in our rail yard and along part of our right of way. And we are uh, going to be coming out with a, an RFP by the uh, by the end of this year for that uh, project. Um, we also have closed on the purchase of a seven and a half acre property with some warehouse buildings at uh, Rolling Mill Road in Baltimore County. And we have already identified at least two customers that we can use the property for. Uh, we're gonna be uh, getting a lumber customer in there and there may be another uh, steel company that may lease part of a building there from us. So that that is to help us to grow and to uh, keep moving with uh, new business. And we are just beginning the process of trying to work with the MDTA on the development of uh, the Kane Street site and which the MDTA acquired uh, for Canton a number of years ago. And uh, we think we have developed a, a need for it. And so we, uh, we're, we're beginning the process of, of working our way through that. Uh, so, if, uh, we have provided the financial statements uh, for the company. If anyone has any particular questions, uh, Dave Bordner is here, our, our CFO, and he could certainly answer the, the accounting questions. Or if you have any other questions about what we do and, and uh, what is happening here at Canton, I'll be more than glad to, to answer those. Okay, thank you, John. Um, are there any questions from any of the members? This is member Rose. Sorry, guys. No, 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 you go, go first. Uh, I'm just curious in terms of, of this year's performance. I know you referred to it. You mentioned just COVID and we lost a couple of customers. I'm just curious about you know, toward the end of the year where we're going to end up and how and going forward, how is this going to impact us? And also you mentioned customer acquisition efforts and, uh, aside from the the rolling mill property just more generally how are we doing with with those efforts okay well the uh, part of what happened in this year is just that most of the businesses as i'm sure many of you know just um we're going through fits and starts with them it things start to ramp up and then they shut down again so probably this year uh looking ahead we're probably going to have a break-even year uh which all things considered, it is not too bad. We we haven't laid anyone off here. Um, we did not apply for for the uh, PPP loans. We uh, we tried to avoid um, 
doing anything dramatic. So uh, this year is probably going to be a wash for us. However, it gives us a chance. We have been focusing on maintenance and things like that, which um, since there, there's less interference from uh, like a busy year, like last year, uh, made that a little more difficult for us. In terms of the new customer acquisition, uh, what we have been doing is we've been focusing a lot more on diversification because we we tend to have a, a large amount of construction material, which of course is very much impacted by things like housing starts and all that. So we're trying to uh, diversify into other pro under types of things. So we've actually gotten into the propane business uh, for us. And the other opportunity for us would be for rail car storage for companies that have cars that they want, would like to uh, basically park for a while. Um, we're out marketing ourselves as a place to do that also. So th those are the two things that we really focused on. Then the new property acquisition for us gives us a chance to work with customers that don't have a railroad siding and we could bring their cars in and transload it out of the rail car onto trucks uh, for delivery, things like that. Thanks, John. Okay. This is member Ardinger. I had several questions. One, um, the impact of the uh, coronavirus and long term going forward in regards to commerce, how you think that will affect um, the future of the business and how you would operate that business? Well, for us, uh, we, we've been uh, very cautious about what we've been doing only because we, I don't want to overreact to it because I do think that there will be uh, pent up demand when this is over. Uh, and one of the things that I think we want to do, uh, um, like I said, moving forward for us is we need to find more opportunity to expand our footprint. Um, we, we are pretty much boxed into a certain area here. And what we would like to be able to do is to find places that we can we can provide services outside of where we currently are. And that's why we're in Cecil County, for example, doing an operation there. And we're also in discussions to look at maybe doing something similar at Bell, Bell Camp. Uh, so for us, it's a matter of finding our little niche in, in places and not trying to just stay where we are and, and try to operate here because we, we're in a very much a gentrifying community and we have to be aware of that and uh, try to position ourselves a little more outside our, our current footprint. Thank you. Um, then specific to the balance sheet, I'm looking at the Canton development. Um, I noticed that there's uh, one of the largest assets is the marketable securities and just trying to understand how that fits into your overall, the purpose of the corporation and Yes. Uh, yeah, well, that that was a, a matter that we, we were beginning to accumulate some cash. And uh, while we were waiting for a better way to invest the money in, in the business, uh, we moved it to the Brown Advisory uh, account to be managed uh, by them. And our ultimate plan is we, we would like to be able to find a better way to leverage that uh, to grow the business and create some more jobs here as opposed to just uh, sort of um, banking the money. Uh, so at this point, what we're doing is it, we're going to, to keep managing that as best we can. And then when opportunities present themselves, we'll, we'll be able to um, have the financial latitude to do that. And uh, our, our, main, our main issue here is we want to be able to um, kind of control our own destiny and not um, Obviously, we we are not beholden financially to MDTA um, directly to do anything. So that's our goal is to be self-sufficient. Thank you. And then just one last question, just in general, I did see there were some large variances in some of the expenses between 2018 and 2019. Just in general, if you can um, anything that's the large variances, just to, to give us an explanation. The, the largest um, things that we would uh, be involved with, whenever um, we're having a better year than, than say, the prior year, we'll, we'll tend to invest a little more heavily in things like track maintenance and uh, facilities. And so we did do that in, in uh, 2019. Um, 
And then there's just a variable cost. You know, when business goes up for us, it means that we run more train crews, which which obviously increases our costs there. So those are the two main uh, areas where we wind up uh, seeing fluctuations in our expenses. Pretty much a lot of our expenses are pretty similar from year to year. Okay. Thank you. Sure. John, for the loan we took from M&T Bank for the property acquisition, what was what the amount of the loan? Uh, 2.7. 2.7 million. Thank you. And the, uh, the, just uh, as information, the property acquisition itself was a, a little under 3.5 million. So, um, so it, we have, we could have probably contributed more toward it, but, but we have never borrowed that kind of money before. So it was also a, a way to establish ourselves in the marketplace because the bank had no, no history with us. John, I have a, uh, Quick question. Um, it relates to what you said. It, we lost um, Home Depot, the Home Depot account to um, Trade Point Atlantic. Um, and when we look at, I think in one of the, um, it was mentioned that three three of our major customers uh, generate about 83% of our business. The um, in terms of vulnerability, do we are we um, uh, concerned about this? Um, happening more with the um, the, the uh, competitive nature of trade point Atlantic I think no. yes I, I do think there's some possibilities of that to some extent and that's why we wanted to we need to diversify ourselves because the um, rather than being being uh, tied up to one or two large customers we need we wanted to have more uh, more kind of moderately sized customers and those are the ones by the way that people don't tend to come after people usually come looking for the larger accounts to try to move them so if we can stay with the customers that are more like our size for example then um, we tend to have a better history with them but yes that is a concern of ours and that's why we're trying to fend that off as best we can but they do have a large advantage at, at trade point that we don't have and that of course is developable land which we we don't have access to well with the um, last little observation i guess or comment is with the 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 shift from uh industrial in the area that we are primarily and you mentioned maybe boxed in a little bit i'm not sure if that's what you were saying but it's shifting it seemed more investment in in that area where we are um, to uh, more residential um, than um, industrial, it's, it appears. And, yes, uh, yes. And I think that's something to be mindful of too, right? But yes, it anyway. is. Yeah, yes, it is. That, that's why, we, because the railroad only goes to certain areas, we, we just have to be um, be kind of mindful of that. And that's, you know, look, there's other ways to, for us to um, sustain ourselves, and it may be just a little bit outside of our current footprint. Okay. All right. Any other questions? One no more question, uh, uh, John. Uh, you mentioned pent up demand a little earlier. Um, how long do you foresee that demand being stalled, or how long do you how long do you think it will be before that comes back online? Well. We, I also I feel like we'll probably see something happen early by say the second quarter of next year, mm -hmm. just from you know conversations we've had with our customers is who some of them have held up their own expansion plans obviously until we get through this. So yeah, I would say second quarter of next year I think we'll start to see ourselves uh, rebound here. Thank you. Okay. Well, we will. Um... I thank all the members for their very good questions and, and thank you, John, um, for um, addressing them. We appreciate that. Um, so um, I guess that is it. We will uh, um, thank you again and we will move on to the, the uh, item number five. And that would be the um, fiscal year 2020 independent auditors SOC one report and Deb and William and Rick will present. 
Good morning. Um, this is Deb Sharpless again. Um, I have the opportunity to introduce SB and Company, specifically Bill Seymour and Rick Williams. Um, they've conducted our SSAE 18 audit for the Easy Pass system in Maryland. So, uh, Bill and Rick, would you like to present to the board members the audit report? Yep. Thank you, Deb. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Bill Seymour. I'm the engagement partner with SB and Company. And this represents our required communications with uh, those charged with governance in regards to the SSAE 18 uh, audit report. Uh, in your package, you should have our presentation. I was going to start on slide three uh, of that, which the results were uh, we did. We performed uh, these procedures for the period of July 1st of 19 through June 30 of 2020. We performed a review of 13 specific control objectives that were described and asserted by uh, conduit as they pertain to the Maryland Easy Pass system. The results, we uh, noted no qualifications within the report. However, uh, we did identify areas where the design or operating effectiveness of that control could be uh, enhanced. And we have a slide that will walk through some of those uh, areas. We perform limited procedures as it pertains to complementary user controls. That is, what are the processes and controls that are in place that uh, the authority has to make sure the conduit is doing the items uh, that they should be uh, re required to do uh, with, within that. Um, there's a minor update on uh, some of the different verbiage that we are waiting for from conduit. Uh, related to subservice organization controls, as well as some IT related descriptions. We've already done the testing. We kind of know what it is that's going to be put into the report, but unfortunately, because of independence requirements, we can't write those. And we actually just received those this morning uh, while uh, during one of the other presentations. So we'll be updating that, which then would be the final step for us to be able to issue uh, this, this report. On slide four is a summary of the uh, uh, findings that we had. I will walk through these fairly high level. Please stop me with any questions that you have. Uh, these, in a lot of ways, are consistent with the items that we found when we did the uh, fiscal year 2019 SSAE 18 report, uh, largely uh, driven as a result of the change in contractors that's in process where conduit has had a number of personnel changes that have occurred and you know getting people up to speed and the documentation and things of the like that occur um, sometimes ca or have caused issues. So I'll walk through these. Uh, the first one is just folks that have access uh, to the various systems because of that change in personnel. They didn't always have the documentation of what it is that those personnel were uh, performing. We didn't find anything that we would term to be malfeasance with that, but just not having the documentation of why people have access to the parts of the, of the different parts of the system that they do. Um, we noted kind of the theme of what it is, is that if you will, in a lot of the reconciliations that are performed on the activity that goes through the different tolls uh, is driven both on a weekly basis as well as a monthly basis. And kind of what we found is that the weekly reconciliations often uh, weren't uh, always reviewed, weren't always completed, but the monthly reconciliations were done much better. So uh, if you will, in violation process, we didn't see where somebody signed off that they re reviewed the reconciliations, but we didn't note any differences uh, with, within those uh, processing violations. Um, the uh, toll transaction processing, um, you know, the weekly reconciliations, there were differences between a dollar and eleven dollars. Now, if I was doing a financial statement audit, I would be able to have a materiality judgment and you know this would not be a big deal. But unfortunately, in an SSAE 18 procedure, we don't have the concept of a materiality that we get to pass on items. But uh, we did note that and to give you an idea, Roughly, um, you know, we had about six million transactions, you know, so, you know, the materiality of this wasn't that big. Reciprocity in this one area has been an issue in years past. 
um, due to largely the timing of uh, reporting from other jurisdictions uh, that come in. So the re weekly reconciliations um, uh, you know, had lots of unreconciled amounts, uh, which were primarily due to timing differences. Um, and then uh, what you will see here is that then with the monthly reconciliations, um, there were we had two unreconciled amounts that we saw one for six hundred dollars and one for three hundred thousand. And once again, those uh, transactions were approximately twenty one million dollars. So from from a financial statement perspective, once again, wouldn't be a big deal if I was issuing that opinion. But herein, with the, we have to report that as a finding. Um, some missing documentation on credit adjustments, weekly reconciliations on inventory management, lots of differences uh, that we saw there. But then on a monthly basis, you know, because of timing of, of activity, things are cleaned up uh, that would be there. And then lastly, uh, reconciliations re related to manual account replenishments. We had uh, four differences uh, ranging from two dollars to uh, nineteen hundred dollars. Um, one of them being nineteen hundred, um, and the others being uh, significantly smaller, between two and fifty bucks. Uh, that that would be there. So, it, you know, when we looked at the SSAE eighteen, right, the processes and the things that Conduit described, you know, we believe that those items were occurring. It's just that attention to detail, the documentation. Uh, wasn't there. And like I said, with the weekly reconciliations, having um, the issues that they did. So if you will, you know, from an auditor perspective, what our judgment, where we do get to apply judgment is whether or not we believe that the processes are in place and on are operating as described. And we believe that to be the case with the exceptions. And then because of the limited use of this report, since you know MDTA is the, prime, the sole user of this and has a number of uh, uh, compensating controls that were in place, that allowed us to get to where we believe that the processes as described are there with these exceptions. And kind of the last part of it would be is, you know, within the, within, the recommendations would be, well, consider getting a new vendor. Well, the authority's kind of already gone down that that path uh, uh, to 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 be there. So uh, the next slide is just a summary of the thirteen areas that we looked at, um, and then the results of tests that would be there, you know, where we said we had exceptions. I had just uh, walked through those um, areas uh, that were there. Uh, once again, you know, uh, looking at that in totality, we believe that the processes as described were there just with those items. Um, and then moving to slide six is just an update, kind of rolling forward some of the issues that we had last year um, on items that have been implemented versus not implemented. Uh, to be there, you can see that there was a lot of items that were uh, looked at and taken seriously, uh, even though um, you had the kind of end of contract that, that would be there. And then lastly, on slide seven, um, we have uh, some more updates that were, that were there. Um, and then on slide eight, we just have kind of a summary of the different results that I kind of walked through in more detail. Um, you know, we, you know, from a timing perspective, perspective. We actually started doing this work back in June uh, for that uh, because of um, some of the transition of personnel. Um, you know, it took time for us to get information from uh, Conduit to be able to complete it, which caused the delays in us being able to complete the report. As I mentioned before, we received the last piece that, that we need to include in the report this morning. Uh, so we will be looking to issue this report, um, you know, if not today, by tomorrow, uh, subject to final approval from MDTA and Conduit on any items that would be there. So I'll stop there and see if there's any questions that I can I can address. I want to thank Luther, uh, Deb, all the folks at MDTA and getting us information on their side of items uh, to to get get us through. Okay. 
Thank you, um, William and Rick. Um, are there any questions from any of the members? So I, I have a question. Maybe this probably is better for Deb, but maybe it involves um, Sophia from the auditor. So since we're transitioning to the new contract, I imagine there probably was not a lot of attention um, really paid toward toward fixing problems since we're moving to a new, a new vendor. So my question is for the for our new vendor vendors, are we going to be discussing these with them and do they have a plan in place to address the areas of findings so that they're not recurring once it's under their watch? And are, can we hold them accountable to that contractually? Yeah, so, so first with the conduit contract, um, Easy Pass Ops under the direction of John O'Neill and Daryl Smith, I think throughout this contract and even now with difficult times with, um, you know, end of contract and those struggles with staffing that comes with that, they have continued to press them to still perform services at the same level that we expected. So we do have more findings, um, but, but there still has always been the pressure on them in order to address them. With, with regard to Transcor and CAPS, they will both have SSAE audits. Um, and we're also, for Transcor side, it's going to be a SOC 2 instead of a SOC 1 audit. Um, through the planning process, we have already been beginning to address this. Um, and um, we're going to have a meeting with our auditors um, next year, it'll be Clifton Larson Allen, that we've arranged a coordination with them where we can go through the control objectives and make sure that we have that planned out. Um, so that's already something that we're, we're thinking about and have been working on um, throughout the implementation process. The contract also has, um, this contract has uh, LDs associated with it. Um, I just can't recall right this second if after if audit is issued, they either have 60 or 90 days to resolve the findings. Um, and if they do not, then we can hold them accountable um, through liquidated damages. And that was specifically put into this contract to help avoid repeat findings like we experienced today. Thanks, Deb. Thank you, Deb. Any other questions? Okay. Um, thank you, uh, gentlemen, uh, William and Rick, for being here. Thank you, Deb. Thank you. Um, let's see. If I see it correctly, I don't see anything else on the agenda. And uh, there are uh, no one has uh, pre-registered to uh, speak today. Is that correct, Natalie? Yes, sir, that's correct. Okay. Um, well, based on that, there nothing on the agenda. Is um, else on the agenda? Is there a vote to adjourn? So moved. Member Carroll. Okay, Member Carroll. And second? Member Ardinger, I second. Okay. Thank you. Um, all in favor? Uh, aye. aye. Okay. Thank you um, all. Uh, this uh, the finance committee meeting uh, is hereby adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day, everybody. Bye. Thanks. Yeah.